Hello, thank you for joining us today for today's webinar, which is Dangers of Online Transactions, How You Can Avoid and Manage Them. This webinar is jointly organized by Law Society Pro Bono Services and the Financial Industry Disputes Resolution Center, also known as FEDRIC. My name is Serene and I'm your host. First, some housekeeping matters. Materials for today's talk can be downloaded from the handout icon on your screen. Please feel free to ask any questions during the webinar using the question mark icon. Only the organizer will be able to see the questions. We will do our best to address your questions during or at the end of the talk. Please note that the discussion and materials provided for this webinar is not intended to substitute any form of professional legal advice. If you require specific legal advice, please consult a lawyer. With that, our speakers for today are Ms. Eunice Chua and Dr. To Si Kiet. Eunice is the Chief Executive Officer of FIDRIC. Prior to this, she was an Assistant Professor of Law at the Singapore Management University School of Law. In the 13 years of her legal practice, Eunice served as an Assistant Registrar of the Supreme Court Magistrate of the State Courts and was also the Deputy CEO of the Singapore International Mediation Centre. Dr. To is the Chairman of Goodwin's Law Corporation. He is the Honorary Legal Advisor of the Information Technology Managers Association Singapore and the Singapore Computer Society. Dr. To is a former Singapore Member of Parliament and President of the Consumers Association of Singapore. Dr. To is also the founder and chairman of CommerceNet Singapore, which was formerly part of a global consortium of e-commerce companies. Thank you, Eunice and Dr. To, for joining us today. Thanks, Irene. Eunice, uh, could you share an overview of um, what is Fidric and how do they assist consumers? Sure. Um, let me share about FIDREC because I think this word may not be so familiar to many of you tuning in. And thank you for joining us this evening. FIDREC stands for the Financial Industry Dispute Resolution Centre. We were established in 2005 to provide a one-stop avenue for consumers who have disputes with their financial institutions. These may be banks, insurers, capital market services licensees, and so on. Uh, we are designated by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Uh, so far, we are the only scheme under the Dispute Resolutions Schemes Regulations. This means that all licensed financial institutions um, by the MAS must subscribe to FIDREC. And when any consumer has a dispute with them, the consumer can come to FIDREC and the financial institution will cooperate with us through a mediation and adjudication process. So let me explain that process a little bit at the next slide. To start the process, uh, we will invite the consumer to file a dispute resolution form. Uh, if the consumer has not yet had a chance to negotiate with the financial institution directly, uh, we will then refer the consumer to the financial institution first, because if matters can be settled at that stage, that is best for everyone. Uh, but if not, then within six months of the, uh, the financial institution's final reply, then the consumer can come to FIDREC and file their dispute. We will do a review to make sure that uh, this dispute falls within our jurisdiction. This means that uh, FIDREC, we have a set of rules that tells us the kinds of disputes that we can handle. So for example, uh, we can handle disputes brought by individuals or sole proprietors, but if a company comes to us with a dispute, we cannot handle such a dispute. Another common example is uh, if a matter is currently undergoing active police investigation, uh, then FIDREC will not be able to handle such matters pending the investigation outcome. But if everything is all right and we can handle the dispute, our case manager will then go on to mediation. And this is a process where we serve as a neutral intermediary. We facilitate discussions between the consumer and financial institution with the aim of trying to bring about an amicable settlement. Um, this happens sometimes, but sometimes it may not. And when it does not, we then offer the consumer a chance to go to the next stage of the process, which we call adjudication. 
Uh, it's another long word, but in, in, in simple terms, it is like a court process because this is a chance for both parties to tell the adjudicator their case and why they sit there, you know, why the adjudicator should uh, rule in their favor or not. Uh, and then the adjudicator will decide the case. All our adjudicators are, are very qualified. And Dr. To is in fact one of them as well, as part of his long list of accomplishments. Um, and our ad other adjudicators are also senior lawyers like Dr. To. Um, some of them are retired uh, judges as well. Um, and finally, when the adjudicator has made their decision on the case, they will prepare uh, a grounds of decision which sets out the reasons uh, as well as the conclusion of the adjudicator. So what is unique about BIDREC is that this decision does not bind the consumer. The consumer has a choice. So the consumer can accept the award, and if they do, the financial institution is bound and they must comply. Um, but if the consumer chooses not to accept, then their legal rights are not affected. They can continue to pursue their claim in court or at other suitable avenues. So this whole process is very affordable. The mediation is free for the consumer. Adjudication is $50 plus GST, uh, but we do have an adjudication limit of $100,000 per claim. Yeah. Thanks, Eunice. Um, that's actually very affordable. It's a lot less than I expected. And I think it's, um, it's quite useful to know that this award that's made uh, is binding on the financial institution, but it's not binding on the consumer. So in a sense, it is another um, venue that a consumer can explore um, before you know, trying to decide um, you know, whether to take the path of going to court. Um, you know, Eunice, given today's topic, uh, what are the trends that you observed at FIDREC about consumers facing issues with digital transactions and online payments? Well, Serene, I think like uh, everyone here, we've seen in the news about you know the rising number of cases where people have fallen victims to scams, particularly in e-commerce scams and online transaction related scams. Uh, at FIDREC, it's no different. You can see from the chart that has been shown that there has been a trend of increase and in the most recent financial year for FIDREC, which is 2020 to 2021, even though we haven't completed the year, you see that the cases already show a, a stark trend of increase. So once we complete the financial year until June, uh, you can expect you know, an even higher spike. This is likely related to COVID-19 as well, because more of us are transacting online, conducting our business online. Um, and this could lead to more opportunities for us to fall victim scams and other unauthorized transactions yeah thanks Eunice um, you know now that you mention it um, it's true I mean because of the measures due to COVID we're all you know um, more homebound you know we've been turning more to online shopping uh, certainly um, uh, you know and it's quite timely that we're having this webinar now so that people are a bit more aware of the potential dangers and you know how to avoid them or perhaps even you're in it, um, how to manage the dispute. Um, let's go through um, a couple of scenarios um, to get yours and Dr. To's thoughts. So let's first start with phishing. So Adam received an email that Pear Brand is having a 50% sale. He bought a laptop through the email link with his credit card. He keyed in the OTP, although the SMS notification stated that the merchant name as Tiger Company instead of Pear Company. After a week, Adam discovered that the email and link was fake. He asked his bank to cancel payment. His bank told him that the chargeback was not successful as a transaction was authorized by Adam. So it seems that um, Adam got a little bit careless and he's in a bit of a pickle. Um, Dr. To, um, just you know, looking at the bank's response, uh, what does the bank mean by a chargeback? No, sorry. Actually, um, it begins with the word charge. So mm -hmm. you have a credit card and you go to a shop, you flash a card, you sign the slip that they give you, and the money is then deducted from your account, or rather, you know, the, you, you, you get a bill at the end of the month and then you pay the bill. So uh, when the card company uh, credit, uh, puts that transaction on your account, that's called a charge. 
So they have charged your account for the amount of money that you spend buying the item. And a chargeback is a reversal of that charge that on, for good reasons, like there is a fraud and you reported the fraud, the card was reported lost. And then after the loss was reported, the card gets charged. Then you get a chargeback. Yeah, so it's a reversal of a payment that would have gone into your account, but for these special reasons. Thanks, Dr. To. Um, out of curiosity, um, you know, pardon me, but you know, when you say chargeback implies that money comes from, I suppose, the bank back to the consumer. So is it is the money coming from the bank or is the money coming from um the tiger company or the pair brand? Well, you see, the thing is when the bank charges the uh, account, your account, they have transferred the money over to whoever has uh, sent the bill, sent the transaction. So you can only reverse that if the party is not a scammer because the scammer would have disappeared and the money is gone and the bank is not able to reverse that. So there won't be any chargeback because the money is gone. And so um, it, in a situation like that, it's actually your own money has gone over to the scammer and it's not recoverable. It's gone. Mm, understood. So, you know, the bank mentioned that the transaction was authorized by Adam. Um, what do you think the bank meant by this? Does this have anything to do with the OTP? Well, again, back to the basic situation. You have a card, you go to the shop, and you pre present the card and you sign the slip and so a transaction is done and you have authorized it with a signature signature so in the terminology of the trade it's called the card presence scenario you have mm -hmm. physical presence and the card is physically presented more and more in even many physical transactions where the shop is physical and you are physically shopping you actually wave your card in front of a reader so you don't actually, uh, you know, the, 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 sh the shop doesn't really, you know, swipe it into a machine. Uh, you don't need to sign. You actually uh, have got a pin perhaps that uh, authorizes that transaction. So when you have an online transaction, of course, then it's what they call the card not present scenario. The card is not there uh, and you are not there. And so they need to have some other method of authentication. And so technology allows us to have this um, ability to, the, for the bank or the merchant to send you uh, uh, an electronic notice, and then you get a, a code called the one-time password, right? The OTP or one-time PIN from the bank, and then you enter it that into the transaction it authorizes your transaction it's as if you signed the transaction slip in a card present scenario so effectively in law mm. your, your signature it authenticates you and it authorizes the transaction thanks dr to and i think that's such a important reminder that um you know if it was a physical transaction you have a signature uh, clearly you're signing something um, and so for OTP although it is numbers um, and it's something done online um, it is as good as basically as you said uh, equivalent to signing um, the card statement or agreeing that you know um, to to basically give money or to credit um, to the particular seller um, and you know I think uh, one of our audience members did did raise a question, you know, saying that, look, it's a scam, um, you know, shouldn't Adam like report to the police? Uh, what are your thoughts on what Adam should do in this situation? Well, I think Singaporeans very often will say something has gone wrong, you report to the police. Uh, you need mm. also to realize that you yourself, Adam, you need to be very careful about making sure you don't get scammed, making sure you are knowledgeable enough not to release your signature just like that. No, in a physical situation, we all know that we don't sign papers anyhow, but the OTP is a signature. It's an electronic signature in a way. So you don't happily sign away your rights. No, don't send in your OTP. But I think it, it again goes back to the basic uh, of basics of how not to be scammed. 
Now, phishing mm -hmm. is a scenario where somebody tries to fish for your details, like the, the phishing, right? And they are going to fish for your signature, your card number, whatever personal data you have that they don't have, they try and fish it. And amongst some of the tricks would be to send you an email that looks like it comes from pair company when actually it comes from tiger it comes from a scammer and so that's one process that they use and sometimes it's pop-ups you know you are happily mm -hmm. still serving in the web and pop something pops up and it looks like whoa dbs or uh, sia uh, offer of the century a free first class ticket on uh, the suites to london immediately after COVID. It, uh, click now or else it will never come again, you know? So I think we need to be very skeptical about these things, right? If it's too good to be true, it cannot be true. And if you really think that SAI, SIA is now trying to revive post-COVID travel, call up SIA directly. Look at their SIA website directly. If it's not there, it's a scam. So I think that's the first thing. Uh, when you look at emails that are sent to you, make sure you look at the line, they call that the, the URL, the link, look at the words. It is very important to see that if it comes from, let's say, Singtel, right? Your, your company, um, Apple, Google, whatever it is, look at the spelling. Very often scams, they look like it comes from Google, but it's actually Goggle or gok girl, you know? And so you need to check the spelling very carefully in the link. Mm. And the other thing to look at is from the dot, okay? It is something, something, dot, something. From the first dot, look backwards and see whether it's Google or it is Tiger or it is somebody else because that is the most important um, item and the long line of letters ignore all that's after the dot ignore everything just look at what's before the dot and if it doesn't come from the company you're expecting tiger uh, 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 pair company in this case then ignore it um in any case like yes. i said go back to the pair website and see whether they are really offering this thing for 50 percent. if it's not there it's silent it's a scam yes. thanks dr to I, I think, think it's such that, a uh, good reminder that uh, prevention is better than cure. You know, as you mentioned, this is a scammer. Um, who knows where he is? And who knows where he's based? It may not necessarily be in Singapore. Even if you make a police report, if he's based overseas, then a bit difficult. So I think it's a good reminder that you had, um, you know, involving trying to avoid some common scams. And um, that basically if something sounds too good to be true, uh, maybe consider it again or go to the original website. Don't just uh, click on the link uh, because it's like own self, confirm own self, which, you know, is, is not really effective. Um, Eunice, um, you know, how does FitJack comes into the picture in this situation? Yeah, so I think Serene, um, what your, you know, what question you received from the one of the attendees, you know, kind of starts us on this journey. So it has happened. What do we do now? Um, I think mm -hmm. that instinct to make a police report is definitely a correct one because you, there has been someone who has committed a crime and offence. So do make a police report, but also please also report immediately to the bank because the bank is able to, for example, cancel your credit card and prevent you know, more of such transactions from happening. Um, and the bank also requires you, right, in their relationship as a, a card issuer, to, for you to report promptly so that you, know, you as the consumer, we as consumers, we play our part as well. So report to the bank, also make your police report. And the bank will then have uh, their own dispute resolution process. This is a requirement um, by the MAS that all banks must have in place a complaints handling process. And this is often done by an independent unit within the bank. So although you know, we as consumers are sometimes skeptical, but this is actually a, a requirement for banks, you know, that you know, it is not the person who is in charge that is you know, investigating, you know, that is not the person. It is actually a separate unit within the bank. So they will often look into this complaint and then they will try to um, come to an, a conclusion with the consumer. Sometimes they might make some uh, offers, sometimes they might not. 
Um, but this is where Fidrek comes in the picture. If you, the consumer, are not satisfied with the bank's response to you, you can then come to Fidrek and then our process will start. Uh, we will then receive your complaint. And you know, if we have, we might ask you questions. So for example, if Adam comes to us and he tells us these facts, uh, we might ask some further questions to understand, um, you know, where did he uh, receive this uh, email from, right? Is it, uh, you know, someone that he, he commonly communicates with? Is it just out of the blue, right? Um, when he keyed in the OTP, did he notice? Uh, what the text of the OTP said. Did he notice the discrepancy that it was tire company instead of pair company? You know, um, when did he actually report to the bank? Did he do it immediately? Did he wait, uh, you know, some days, some weeks? So all these would be very relevant information for us. We would ask all this from Adam. At the same time, we will also go to the bank and we will ask the bank to give us a full investigation report. So the bank is obliged to, to give to FIDREC, um, you know, the outcome of their investigation. They will summarize it. They will often have, um, you know, uh, enclosed any conversations that they had with, with Adam. They would share those with Fidrek. And when we see the both sides, you know, being in a neutral position, we can then be in a better place to make suggestions. Uh, we can organize a discussion with all parties present to see whether there is any room for the bank to make any offer. So unlike in court, where, you know, what is important is your legal rights. So Dr. Toh says, you know, here, there's an OTP, you keyed it in, technically, by law, uh, you have authorized the transaction in the, in the sense that you have signified your approval for it, and the bank is perfectly entitled to go ahead with the transfer. As Dr. Toh says, you know, the bank, the money is not sitting with the bank, the money has, has already gone, right? So mediation is a chance to think beyond the legal rights. And sometimes we encourage the customers and, and, and the banks to think about other broader factors. So for example, this might be a very valuable customer, a long time customer from the bank. They have you know, been very dutiful with their payments and so on. And the bank might say, okay, you know, in account of our long-term relationship, and also Adam, I noticed, you know, maybe Adam is a rather elderly person um, and who, you know, is it, uh, you know, doesn't read English so well and, and hence, you know, was more likely to be tricked. Uh, in, in some situations like that, the bank might say, well, I might make some offer to um, maybe allow you to waive off a certain percentage of the figure you ought to have paid me, right? And so I will absorb the balance. But this is all goodwill on the part of banks and this is what the mediation tries to do. And of course, if, you know, there is no agreement there, then the consumer, we give them the choice and they can go to someone like Dr. Toh, who will then look at all the evidence, right, and make a decision as to whether or not Adam was, in fact, entitled to repayment. Thanks, Eunice. Um, I think, you know, this is a very, I think, stressful situation, you know, for anyone who is involved in it, you know, feeling frustrated, feeling a bit cheated, you know, in a way, I think it was a good reminder that ultimately, um, the scammer could have run away the money. So actually going through the bank um, is sometimes actually the bank coming up with the money. It's not so much that they're able to recover the money from the scammer because most likely they probably have taken the money out and closed the bank account. Um, and I think one of the audience member has made a very useful point. Uh, do alert pair, pair company that this is happening so that pair company can perhaps set a alert or you know um, let its consumers know that this is happening. So I think that's a pretty good uh, tip. Uh, another um, audience member has asked, um, is there a specific time frame to report to the bank or police for this sort of situation? You know, is, is there a, you know, one week, one month, one year? Well, I think, let me jump in. It's as soon as possible. Uh, when mm. you want to complain to FIDREC or CASE, because I used to be president of CASE, we tell people, you need to raise this as quickly as possible, not one week later, that's for sure. Yeah. And, uh, and as soon as possible means sometimes you don't know about it. Yeah, it's true. Um, the important thing is not to uh, be caught in the first place. Yeah, but once you realize you've been caught and scammed, uh, don't sit on it. Mm. Yeah, so I, I agree with Dr. To. Most of the um, you know credit card agreements that we've seen at Fidret requires the consumer to report immediately right which is as soon as possible um so no don't delay just 
make it make the report as soon as as you realize yeah understood and i think um yeah, so I mean, I think basically when you um, discover um, you've been scammed, go to quickly report to the police, um, notify the bank as well as, you know, also notify the, the company, even though the company itself is not the scammer, but it's good for them to know so that they can in turn uh, alert uh, the public so that the public does not get scammed in return. Um, now I have an interesting question, Eunice, uh, from the audience. Um, what's the difference between Friedrich and Case? Is Friedrich like Case? Thanks for that question, Serene. Uh, FIDREC is unlike CASE. So CASE is a consumer association. They advocate for consumers and they represent the voice of consumers. Uh, FIDREC is different. We are an alternative dispute resolution centre. So meaning that we don't take side. We are not acting for the banks or we're not acting for the consumer. Rather, our role is to see whether we can facilitate a resolution. So that would be the key difference. Um, Case would be there for you to um, handle disputes with merchants who are not financial institution. So, you know, if, for example, um, Pair Company was a, a real company, right, and the scenario is a bit different, you have a dispute with Pair Company over the product, the product was not as you had expected, right, then this is a situation where Case could help, um, whereas you would come to FIDREC only where it involves a licensed financial institution. So, our subject matter areas of handling are different, as well as our role in the handling of the dispute. I think Thanks, the, other difference, the other difference is CASE is a membership organization and ah. FIDREC is. So you have to be a member of CASE for CASE to uh, take up your complaint. Uh, whereas FIDREC will take up your complaints as long as you've been involved with a financial institution and you pay your $50. The other difference between Case and FIDREC is um, FIDREC is not consumers association in that they would not be advocating changes, they will not be lobbying banks or whatever, whereas Case is in that sense a consumer advocacy organization, they will be lobby government, lobbying government, they will be uh, uh, approaching companies to make sure they follow best practices and so on. So, that's the second difference. Case does have uh, dispute resolution procedures, but they are essentially uh, just part of the tool back they have in helping consumers. Thanks, Dr. Toh. Uh, I think we're quite lucky to have you on the panel uh, because you have past experience with Case and are very well able to articulate the difference between uh, Vidric and Case. Um, so Case is possibly another venue as well um, that you can um, rely on or could visit, uh, but of course, again, depends on the dispute. Um, let's move on to our next scenario, dealing with malware and electronic wallet, which I think most of us are using today. Um, I pause here to remind the audience that you can submit your questions in the Q&A panel. Ben receives a call from his service, internet service provider to download a file on his laptop to fix his internet connection. Ben receives notifications of unknown purchases. He checks his bank statement and discovers 40 unknown transactions made through his electronic wallet that is linked to his credit card. After work, he reports the incident to the bank. The bank tells Ben that it cannot raise a charge back because they are contactless transactions and that Ben should have immediately notified the bank when he first received the notification. Um, so Dr. To, um, again, you know, looking at the bank's response, I mean, what does it mean that um, they are contactless transactions? Right, so remembering the earlier scenario, I mentioned that you can have a card present situation where you present a physical card to a physical shop assistant. And increasingly, you have this added convenience of there is a reader there, you just flash, and technically there's no contact there too. But a more uh, important contactless situation is what many of us are doing now with online shopping. Online shopping, you're not physically in the shop, it's not a physical shop, you're not physically even using your card, you're just keying in a number. And so this is a contactless situation and therefore it is more important for you to be 
particularly savvy about what uh, you need to do to prevent online frauds. And so this whole situation earlier on of a, about the OTP, just remembering that this is your signature and don't just happily give your OTP to anyone. So, so if someone says, hey, I'm Singtel, I just sent you an OTP, can you read back to me? You say, thank you very much, I'm not reading back to you. <laughs> yeah, you are not the right person because uh, you, you, you know, looking at the email that you sent me, to, you, you are supposed to be singtel.com, but after uh, that, there's a hyphen and there's a slash and there's a whole lot of other things after that. So I'm not uh, believing that you are Singtel. Mm. One of the things that uh, people don't realize is that the government we have in Singapore is so uh, protective of us that they have the I IMDA has asked all uh, the the, so the 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 ISPs, the internet service providers, and the telcos to make sure that when you get a if you get a phone notification, for example, you make sure that if it's an internal call from Singtel, there won't be a plus 65. A plus, whether it's plus 65 or plus 66 or plus 921, whatever it comes from a foreign country, ignore it. I think that's a very useful tip. And in fact, I think scammers are getting a bit more sophisticated. Um, I myself received a scam call and it wasn't even a person, it was um, AI, it was an electronic, um, I had the press buttons. I mean, obviously I put down the phone, but I was amazed at how advanced they are. You know, instead of using people to call you, now they use machines. Um, so I think you're quite right, Dr. To, that, you know, you have to be really careful when it comes to calls. So, you know, earlier situation, over email. This situation, um, over the phone. So do try to be very careful. And as the doctor told said, I think earlier, or maybe drawing parallels is that, you know, you could, if you're really concerned and you really think that it's a real um, person from your particular service provider, you can always put on the phone, go and look for the actual number and call back the actual uh, service provider to double check if it is authentic. Um, so I guess Dr. To, what do you think um, Ben should do in this situation? Yeah, I think, uh, Eunice said earlier on, you have to immediately uh, call. And I use the word as soon as possible because actually sometimes the immediate thing is, yeah, you, we are like this this guy, Ben, is doing his working, so I cannot call now. You know, my boss is talking to me. Sure. <laughs> but I think you have to be as immediate as possible. Boss has put on his phone, poor boss has left the room, quickly call up the bank and say, I have been scammed, please stop it. And don't wait till after work because that's too late. You see, because the bank also needs to react quickly. And mm. so if you have just been scammed, you just not, uh, receive notifications of unknown purchases, call immediately and say, please stop it. And uh, the bank may be able to stop it just in time. Yes, and especially Dr. To, in, in this instance, it's 40 transactions. So obviously the scammer is using the details, you know, compared to the first scenario where it just stopped at the whatever they bought from the fake website. And in this case, um, they actually have your contacts and they are still using it. You have 40, which is quite a lot. Um, mm. And I think one question um, that an audience member had is, you know, in this situation, Ben didn't exactly agree for his uh, electronic wallet to be used. You know, in the earlier situation, there was an OTP in the physical card, there's a signature. Um, in this instance, it was an electronic wallet, so it's a contactless transaction. So why is it in this case, Ben um, is bound by this, even though he did not have an OTP, for example? So you see, in this case, you have downloaded money from your own, own account into an electronic wallet. And the whole terms and conditions of your electronic wallet basically is whatever is inside there has been pre-authorized to be paid out. And so you need to be very careful that if any transaction comes from your wallet that is not authorized, you stop it immediately. But I, I also would go further and say to consumers using electronic wallets, keep the wallet amount small. And if you do need to make a big purchase every now and then, load the wallet with that amount specifically, exactly, and then uh, use it and that's done. So don't put a lot of money in your wallets. And secondly, I would even say, make sure your electronic wallets are maybe from a specific uh, 
platform specific uh, credit card specific um, service provider so that you know that whatever scams that may come by people who hack into your account or whatever there is a very minimum amount inside there and if you if, even if you want to be you know most people will say i want to be conveniently able to say transact every time i go i flash my grab pay card whatever it is just put enough money for what you normally would transact so if you use your grab pay for hawkers how much can you eat a day fifty dollars just put fifty dollars in a wallet and nobody can scam you anymore because they they only scam fifty dollars Thanks, Dr. To. Um, I think you highlighted an uh, important thing to consider, which is, you know, with convenience, it also comes with its drawbacks. So for, a wall for electronic wallet, you have the convenience where you don't have OTP, you don't need to sign. Um, but the so-called price you pay uh, for that is basically um, in such a situation, um, you know, in the bank's view that the fact that someone has access to your, ele to your electronic wallet, um, you know, is able to basically make these claims. It'll be harder for you to contest it. Um, mm -hmm. So Eunice, uh, what were your thoughts about this situation? Well, in, in this situation, I think the first thing to note is that Ben had received the notification. So um, for all of us with an electronic wallet or credit card, every time it is used, um, pass a certain threshold transaction and, and you can set this limit. So very, very cautious people can set the limit to zero dollars. You know, so any single cent that goes through, they will receive a notification. So this is something that, that you can set and you have some control over. So if you're very cautious, right, set a very low limit so that you'll be notified and it's not triggered by the default amount, right? The default amount would tend to be, you know, uh, at least a hundred dollars generally, yeah? So this will prevent you from, you know, having many, many, many small transactions go through and they all add up. So the first thing to note is the, your notification setting, take note of that. And if you do receive a notification, uh, respond uh, immediately uh, as Dr. Toast said. So I think that question about, you know, unlike the first scenario, I didn't key in an OTP. I did not authorize this. So how can it be that I'm responsible? So this is something we hear at FIDREC quite a bit because I think understandably so, right? I, I did not do anything, but yet I have, have to pay, you know, maybe thousands and thousands of dollars for all these transactions. So here, what the consumer actually did was to download this file, right? Thinking that it would fix this internet connection. And this is where the, the problem lies, right? Um, because at law, you have authorized, right? Because certain events have happened, like Dr. Toast said, um, by downloading this software, you have perhaps given access to your account all right, to this scammer, and the scammer can then impersonate you and carry out all these actions as if they were you. Um, and how is the bank to know any better? Because they process you know, so many, many transactions uh, every minute you know, each day. So on the bank's perspective, a lot of things are what they call a straight through processing the the it goes without any uh, human intervention at all the money is transferred automatically um so it, this is the convenience that serene you pointed out right straight through processing a lot of convenience for everybody um but yes there are some risks yeah so i just wanted to add that for notifications set your transaction limits um make sure you check your notifications respond to them uh, and be very, very careful about downloading files on your computer because you might not intend it, but the effect of that action is that you have allowed someone else to impersonate you. Uh, and only we can safeguard our own account. Uh, and hence, um, currently, the law places responsibility on the consumers. Uh, and if you look at uh, the e-payments guidelines that MAS has issued, you would see that consumers actually have the responsibility to safeguard their one-time password and also safeguard access to their accounts. So this would include having your uh, antivirus software installed and updated, you know, installing all the relevant patches and updates. So these are some responsibilities that we all have as consumers that we may not be aware of, um, but I hope that this is a chance for, for us to draw all this to everyone's attention. Yeah, I Thanks, think, Eunice. Uh, yeah, I, Sorry, I go ahead, Dr. To. I would add that other than but it's a, we, we need to make sure we have uh, malware protection. 
So our phones, our computers have got this uh, software that prevents them from being hacked or being uh, uh, accessed by unauthorized people. But be very careful that you get these malware protections uh, from the anti antivirus software, whatever it is from reputable uh, companies too, because a scammer could send you a free uh, malware protection and you get scammed. But the other thing is, yeah, like in this case, oh, we are your internet service providers, there's something wrong with your account, please. Uh, we are sending you this link, please click it and uh, we will be able to repair your phone from uh, remote access. Never, never click on any Thing that's emailed to you from an unknown email even if it looks like your email provider you can always like we said earlier on call back the company and say did you send me this and they you might find out no they didn't so don't just click on anything sent to you don't click on pop-ups don't um uh, the other thing is don't actually surf in using free wi-fi we all love free wi-fi you go in a public place you surf free wi-fi and then you are actually having your access op your your door your house all the windows and doors are open because people can look at what you're doing and maybe even the wi-fi provider is peeping at your account so don't use free wi-fi public wi-fi for your personal transactions thanks dr so, to um eunice you received an interesting question from an audience member they ask um does fidrek publish um pass uh, cases or disputes because it will be quite interesting to understand uh, what are the bank's usual, usual positions. We currently don't uh, publish such decisions uh, because under our uh, rules that govern how we work, we are meant to be a confidential process. So currently we, we do not publish, but what we do is to share case studies instead. So if you go on the FIDREC website under our publications tab, uh, in our annual report, we will always share a few case studies and we will also uh, have a series of articles um, where we share case studies with the press and so on. And these are all reported so that people can find out more. Um, in this sort of scenario, it is actually not uncommon. And um, generally, if the consumer is able to show that, you know, he or she has been careful. Right? So if, for example, you did not in fact download this file, you will actually you know, blameless, some criminal had hacked into your computer, right? In, in that sort of situation, you report promptly. Um, there is generally a limit that is placed on your liability. And, you know, in certain circumstances, the, the bank or the card company might even be able to, you know, waive the full amount. But if you had taken some kind of action that, you know, showed you to be at fault, uh, this is where uh, it makes the, you know, where... We, we try and encourage uh, some settlement and mediation, but it all depends on, on the goodwill of the financial institution. Yeah. I think the underlying maybe concern or question, I guess, for some consumers is given that, you know, in these situations that we discussed, uh, legally, um, they come somewhat on the wrong side uh, because, you know, they were a bit careless. Um, so I guess you're wondering, you know, were there any instances where a consumer um, was successful in their discussions or negotiations with the banks? I, I would say yes. And, and I'll give some hope to everyone that uh, there are situations where the financial institutions have been very reasonable and they consider uh, your behavior as, as their customer. Um, they consider, you know, your profile. If, for example, you are vulnerable, you are elderly. Uh, I think financial institutions in Singapore, at least, um, although we, we often see them all as a, a huge organization and, you know, faceless and, and so on. But uh, from what we have seen at, at FITREC, there have been cases that have managed to settle um, amicably because the financial institution is willing to make a, a goodwill offer. Yeah, although, like I said, it does depend on the situation because if there is some clear wrongdoing, uh, then it becomes more challenging. Yeah. Thanks, Eunice. Um, you know, we were talking about electronic wallets, you know, and you were mentioning about financial institutions. Um, I understand uh, one audience member has a question that some, you know, sometimes it may be payments, basically, to a payment system, and it's not necessarily linked to a financial institution. So does FIDRED only cover electronic wallets if it's linked to financial institutions, or does it also cover third-party service providers? 
that's a, a great question and I appreciate the chance to address that point. Um, FitTrack, we only have, um, you know, the, the remit to handle disputes against licensed financial institutions. So if an institution is not licensed, uh, we have no ability to ask that institution to come and be subject to, to FitTrack, you know, and to comply and, and to be bound and, and so on. Uh, all this is, is not in play at all. So if you are dealing with an unlicensed entity, then, uh, you know, in fact, you are uh, in a bit of a difficult position because you are not able to come to FIDREC for recourse unless you can actually get that, the entity to agree to come to FIDREC, right? And, and that might sometimes be a challenge because as Dr. To had shared earlier and, and you observed, Serene, we don't mm. know where some of these, um, you know, companies are headquartered actually. They might not be in Singapore, they're in other jurisdictions. And in that situation, we have very limited ability to, you know, negotiate or even contact them. Yeah. Thanks, Eunice. Many of these situations, as more and more uh, tech companies come out and provide tech services and so on, the consumer needs to be aware of uh, situations where wallets, electronic wallets, even the ones you may be using right now, they may be tied to a card, which is then a bank card and then banks are regulated by MAS. But it could be a service provider's own wallet. So if I'm XYZ company and you are a customer of XYZ and I have an electronic wallet, you you top up with money from your bank or whatever it is or from past transactions, from points, whatever, and you pay out of that wallet. That wallet, generally speaking, won't be regulated by MAS. It's a service provider, a merchant's own wallet. So you have only recourse against that company and particularly if they are in Singapore, but if it's an electronic wallet offered by a merchant elsewhere outside of Singapore, well, kiss your money goodbye because you're not going to go to Washington or Moscow or whatever to sue them, right? Thanks, Dr. To, And I think that's a very useful reminder to everyone that, you know, um, when it comes to so much, you know, besides electronic wallets, you said, you know, certain, certain tech companies nowadays also offer um, payment mechanism or wallets or however you like to call it. Um, it can be challenging if you have any disputes with them, especially if they're not in Singapore. And in the case that they're not a financial institution, um, then they wouldn't be covered by uh, FIDRIC. Um, there's a follow-up question. Is there any plans or thoughts about whether um, FIDRIC will extend its coverage to um, third-party service providers? Well, I think that uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore is uh, you know, looking at this issue to, to see whether there is any gap. Um, the reality with regulation is that it often has to play catch up a bit, right? It reacts to, to the situation. So at the moment, um, we are still constrained by the current framework. Um, but I understand and I think the, the signs are all pointing towards this is an area being reviewed and there might be changes down the road. But uh, till then, uh, it would be as Dr. To says, everyone, we just have to beware and, you know, be very careful about who we are dealing with. Yeah. And it's easy to check if an institution is licensed by the Monetary Authority of Singapore because on the MAS website, they maintain a directory of all the financial institutions. So if you can search there, you'll be able to see immediately whether or not uh, that company you're dealing with is a licensed uh, financial institution. Thanks, Eunice. Um, not sure if you know this um, answer off the top of your head, um, but an audience asked, is PayPal a financial institution? I, my recollection is, is no, uh, it is not. Yeah, but I will double check that uh, in a moment <laughs> where where, sure, where, no where worries. Yes. but in any event um you're able quite able and quite easily able to find a list of financial institutions on MES website which i think is pretty handy um so right now uh, i think we need to move on to the next scenario which deals with different products so diana bought a number of things online so we are walking through her shopping spree <laughs> So first, she bought an investment product that offered 10% returns. When she failed to receive the returns, she asked her bank to reverse the transaction. Her bank told her that it cannot do so. So Dr. To, uh, what are your thoughts on Dinah's plight? 
I think I said early on this very key principle. When you see something as too good to be true, it is not true. And you know, if you see something that's a deal of the century, grab it now or you never come again. Ignore it because a deal of a century doesn't doesn't come uh, even in a century. So don't be tempted by these things. And especially when they rush you and say you got to make a decision now. Okay, lots of scams are based on pressuring you to do something you really don't want to do, and then they they scam you. The main thing to re, uh, remember here is that the company the merchant the whoever is selling this product even if it's a financial institution is in a different jurisdiction in a different country and so it's not regulated by mas mas you, you think it's very powerful but it's not able to reach out to a, a financial institution in another country so it is out of jurisdiction and there's no way mas can help you here uh, and uh, the police too can i help you because the police also have a limited jurisdiction to singapore and thirdly i think i hinted on earlier on i hinted on this earlier on that it's if it's a distant jurisdiction in another country even if you have the money you won't bother because you spend fifty dollars and you're going to spend five thousand dollars to fly there and uh, fifty thousand to get a lawyer there no of course it doesn't make sense right so just know that there are some things that are just not practical so if you want to risk your investments in online investments like that then limit the amount that you are risking your money to on you know and make sure that if you really are interested in this investment it comes from a reputable organization and again not just from an email or a link go back to the website of the company Goldman Sachs, whatever it is, and uh, see what they are really doing, and if they really have got that product being sold like that. Thanks, Dr. To. Uh, I think right now, um, you know, I guess people, you know, even though it's a COVID situation, I think people see opportunities in overseas investments. You know, I think we're witnessing quite interesting um, stock and shares trends uh, overseas, and sometimes you want to get in, you know, in the uh, in the good deal. And I guess sometimes they, they try to you know, buy shares or stocks or investment products overseas and they do so to an international or overseas entity. So I think uh, it was a good reminder, Dr. To, that if you deal with an overseas or international entity, um, it is a little bit more difficult because uh, MES wouldn't have jurisdiction over such an entity. Uh, and certainly, you know, when you look at the amount of money that you invested in versus how much it would take to even find an entity overseas, um, you, you really should think again or, or deal with an, a certain amount that you're willing to uh, take a risk on. Um, Eunice, do you have anything to add to what Dr. Toh has to say? Well, um, in this situation, we have Diana going to the bank to ask the bank to reverse the transaction. Uh, we have seen such cases at Fidrec before. And I think in the course of mediation, we often have to explain, as I think Dr. To tried to earlier as well, that um, it is not as if the transaction can be reversed or, or the money can, can, you know, be you press a button and the, and the transaction will be undone. Right? We, we cannot do a, a control Z for, for such um, transactions. So I think um, for consumers, the perspective is, can't the bank just reverse the transaction? And often we have to spend some time to explain um, how this payments process works. Uh, in the end, the money has actually already gone out, even though the bank um, comes to you know, charge you for it later, right? Such is the arrangement of a credit card, for example. And now with many online investment platforms, you can even use your credit card to pay to make such transactions. And that is how sometimes uh, banks end up being involved in cases at the drag where actually the wrongdoer is not the bank, but that scam investment company, right? Um, unfortunately, the, the bank is the one who is here, who is licensed. And so um, consumers sometimes would look to the bank. Um, and, and this is the kind of situation where in mediation, we will explain matters um, to both parties. Um, of course, we will you know, encourage the bank to see whether there is any um, opportunity for settlement. But then again, we also see the perspective on both sides. So just as we understand how the consumer feels very hard done by, we also understand that from the bank's perspective, 
uh, if they, you know, in fact, pay out 100% on every single one of these instances, uh, this also affects other customers of the bank, right? The commercial profitability of the bank, the bank's shareholders, our whole financial ecosystem. So, um, you know, being in the kind of a neutral position uh, and, and being able to see both sides, uh, FIDREC will, you know, try and ask questions in this scenario to find out more information, right? How did this investment product come about? Was it recommended by someone from the bank, for example? So if it was, then maybe we can, you know, tie back to find that there has been some kind of wrongdoing on the part of the bank, right? Because if, if your bank is truly as innocent as you, then it's difficult to say, well, the bank, you should be, you should be responsible, right? Where, where the consumer was the one who was a bit careless. Yeah, so Thanks, I think Eunice. based on these facts, yeah, we'll have to do some more investigation. I think Thanks, in this case, uh, Dinah bought this online, so perhaps there wasn't a bank in Singapore that's involved. But I think Eunice is right. If there is a bank in Singapore involved, it, it may not still get recourse because the bank officer who recommended you did it out of not negligence, but out of you know good faith and all that, all the necessary checks. Uh, I I I would still say it is best not to jump on the bandwagon because everybody is joining in. Uh, that's the time where you don't join in. But also, um, if you really want to have, you're a lay investor and you don't really have a lot of money to invest, invest it in Singapore in products that are regulated the MAS. At least there will be some recourse if there is fraud or if there is uh, malfeasance, that there is some crime that was uh, done. So MAS can take action and you can be protected. The insurance schemes and all that, that will protect some bit of your investment. So don't go and do online when you can, you have so many things you can invest in Singapore. Thanks, Dr. To. Um, let's move on to the next item on Diana's uh, shopping spree. Now, Diana bought a branded bag payable in installments over two years. As she lost her job, she asked the bank to cancel the installment plan and tried to return the bag. The vendor refused to refund Diana's money and the bank told her that it cannot cancel the installment plan. I suppose in Dinah's perspective, she's thinking, hey, it's an installment plan. Why can't I just cancel it or stop it halfway? Um, Dr. To, uh, what are your thoughts on the situation? I think your problem here is not with the bank. It's with the vendor, the seller of the handbag. And if it's a brand new bag, very often they would have terms and conditions and they will have dispute resolution. Uh, in, in case and in feedback, they will always say to you, first go and resolve your differences with the service provider or the uh, product uh, seller. So in this case, your terms and conditions may well say, these things are on an installment scheme. And if you lose your job or whatever, there may be terms that allow you to terminate. Maybe after two, pay two more payments, or maybe this is the last payment, if you give 30 months notice or whatever it is, there will be something in your terms and conditions you go back on. Uh, that's the only recourse you have because the bank has already sent the money and the bank cannot stop. It's not like, the, unless of course the arrangement with the vendor was uh, part by part. Really there were 10 installments and each installment to be, to be debited only uh, 10 intervals, then of course you can stop the future. But in most of these so-called installment payments, the bank has already paid everything. And the merchant has received 100% of everything. So you have got to go back to the merchant. Thanks, Dr. To. Uh, Eunice, uh, any views on this? Just to add to what Dr. To said that uh, indeed, um, in these sorts of installment plan situations, what happens is that the bank has already paid on your behalf right and it is allowing you to pay it in installments and so um, this installment plan is not something that uh, can be cancelled just like that uh, as, as Dr. To has explained so I think it's also important for us to bear in mind that uh, you know when we purchase things like uh, you know so for example gym memberships right or spa packages that that you know require uh, payments over time but that company might close down right before you actually enjoy all the benefits that you are entitled to uh, in such a situation you know similar to Diana's situation you know this installment plan is also not something that you can simply just cancel right so the to prevent such such uh, incidents from happening the safer thing to do is to 
not buy now, pay later, right? Or if you do so, um, do so with your eyes open, knowing that you do take some risk. So you might consider a shorter package rather than a longer package, just in case um, that company uh, doesn't continue business. Thanks, Eunice. Um, I think, no, I didn't know that. Okay, so I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, it's not really a case where uh, when it comes to installment plan that you're paying the merchant bit by bit. Actually, the bank has already fully paid the merchant um, and so actually you're just paying off your debt to the bank. So as uh, Dr. Toh had wisely pointed out, um, your first stop is please go and speak to the vendor first to see whether they're willing to um, you know, reach some sort of compromise. Um, if not, uh, from the bank's position, um, it's already paid up. Uh, you know, even if you're biased remorse, uh, it's a bit too late. So as Eunice had pointed out, um, you know, then please be a bit more thoughtful when it comes to, I suppose, installment packages, especially when, you know, I myself, you know, you buy those uh, huge spa packages because the bigger the package, the more discount you get. Um, but of course, in return, if the spa or the gym closes down, then you bear the risk um, of losing your installment plan or the money that you've already paid to the gym or the spa. Now we've come to the last item on uh, Diana's shopping spree. So Diana bought clothes on carousel. Uh, despite paying uh, the seller beforehand, uh, the seller did not deliver the clothes. So in this case, it is a legitimate seller. Um, you're using or you're buying through a third party app. It just happens that the seller did not perform its end of the deal. Um, so Dr. To, what do you think Diana should do? Firstly, I think, as I said earlier on, go to the vendor and work out something. Uh, it could be something you can uh, compromise on. Uh, the vendor may have terms and conditions, as I said, which allows you to uh, have redress. Uh, for example, refund your money because the clothes were not delivered and they may explain it because, you know, the manufacturer never, never delivered. So go back to the vendor. Secondly, in some platforms, um, you can actually uh, go to the platform and say, I have bought something from one of, one of the merchants on your platform. According to your terms and conditions, I can do this and you will do this for me. So some platforms will allow, would, would, would take up your case for you to the merchant. Uh, one of the things that you can look up for is something called a trust mark. Um, there is this global organization called the World Trust Mark Alliance. And the World Trust Mark Alliance has got uh, come, uh, uh, trust mark providers in each country, like in Singapore, Trust SG, Commerce Net provides a trust mark too. And so if this merchant is trust marked by a trust mark that is also a member of the World Trip, uh, Trust Mark Alliance, then the Singapore uh, company, let's say Commerce Net or Case, can then approach the WTA member in say Vietnam, you bought this from Vietnam or China, and then they would do the online dispute resolution for you. So online dispute resolution ODR is something that happens on some platforms and uh, uh, companies that have got a trust mark. Now, the other thing that can happen is you, um, you actually could look at the uh, service provider sophistication. So you buy branded clothes, for example. For example, uh, early on, uh, she bought a branded bag. Some of these branded bags could be fixed. I mean, you go on certain platforms. I won't name them online, but you go to certain platforms, and you for sure you're gonna bang a, a fake. So um, some of these platforms, they they provide blockchain certificates. And this is something that's going on and it will become popular. I'm buying, I'm paying so much money for a branded bag. I want a certificate of title and it's blockchain protected. So I know this really comes from Gucci and not from Gucci in China. So mm. yeah, so that's how you protect yourself in online transactions like this. Thanks, Dr. To. Uh, Eunice, anything to add? Uh, just to add to what Dr. To said about the different platforms have different uh, mechanisms. So, for example, you can choose how you pay in certain situations. Some platforms are such that, uh, you know, you will only release payment to the, the seller once you acknowledge that you have received the goods. So, such platforms, you know, uh, allow you to, to, you know, purchase goods online with a bit more security of mind. And even if you choose to, to deal with um, 
you know, someone directly, it is always wise to, uh, you know, you can always arrange a meetup, for example, in, in person to make sure that there is an actual exchange rather than, you know, transferring advanced and, and so on. So always remember that you have choice, right? Consumers have choice. There are certain deals that might look very, very attractive, um, but you do have a choice. There, there are many, many platforms offering, you know, very similar goods, and you can choose one that uh, is able to reassure you that you will receive the good before your payment actually goes out uh, to the seller. Um, another thing that this uh, scenario allows me to illustrate is also um, going back to that question about the difference between case and FIDREC. So in this kind of uh, situation, you are dealing with uh, a merchant who has defaulted on their obligation to give you some clothes that you had paid for. Right? So this is the sort of scenario that would go to, to case. Um, there might be a situation where Diana had paid the seller using her credit card. Okay. So if so, this is where FIDREC might come into the picture because um, if you have uh, bought something and you have not received payment for it, this is one of the reasons that uh, you, know, you can go to the bank and ask the bank to do a, a, a chargeback because uh, you have, you can show your evidence that uh, you, know, you have made payment for certain goods they were promised to you. You have tried to contact the seller. The seller is uncontactable, for example. Right? And if you report it quickly, um, there might be a chance uh, that the, the, the chargeback is successful. So just to say a little bit more about chargeback. So now that we're a bit used to this term, right? it doesn't yes. sound so unfamiliar. So I just want to bring in one more entity, which is the, the card issuer, right? whether it is Visa or MasterCard. This process of chargeback is actually governed by that, that card association's rules. So the financial institutions in Singapore don't actually have a say as to whether or not the chargeback is granted. This depends on the rules between the, our banks, right, and Visa and MasterCard and, and so on. So what the financial institution can do for you is on your behalf request that chargeback, ask for that process to happen. But if the response is that, oh, this has failed or, you know, uh, you know the chargeback is not successful, then um, this is a case where, as Dr. To says, the bank is already out of pocket and you know, whether there can be any kind of uh, settlement where you know, maybe the consumer accepts a portion of the responsibility and the bank agrees to waive, this would sort of be a kind of ideal situation for the consumer. Uh, but then again, uh, depends on the goodwill uh, of the bank involved. Thanks, Eunice. Um, we're now moving on to our Q&A segment. I would like to remind our audience that you can still submit your questions to the question mark icon on your screen. I think the first question is, you know, given this COVID situation, unfortunately, um, some businesses that closed down or um, didn't survive. Um, for this particular audience member, um, has bought a particular, um, you know, they didn't specify, but let's say, for example, they bought a particular item uh, from the business and it's on installment plan. So if the business has closed down, um, do they still need to continue to serve the installment plan or does it automatically stop because the business is out of business? Uh, maybe Dr. To, um, if you could share yeah. your view on this. I think in this case, it depends on how the arrangement was finally arranged. Uh, if I buy, let's say I buy a car from um, Toyota and uh, Toyota, uh, Toyota arranges for a bank loan from XYZ Bank. So if Toyota or the dealer closes down, I'm still have, I still have to pay the bank because actually the bank paid Toyota and the dealer has been paid and dealer closure shop and all that. The money is taken away, but I still have to pay the bank. So uh, it depends on the arrangement. If, if the money was such that, I don't think that's very often, but if the money was directly, uh, because you could get a situation where the seller of the goods will activate the account uh, once every month to get paid. So it's like a monthly bill. So if that's real situation, and if the company is gone, uh, technically, if you don't pay, because you still have to pay this, this, you bought goods from this company and you're keeping the goods, you're not returning the goods. So the liquidator, there could be somebody else called the liquidator who is actually uh, taking charge of the company and collecting all the debts 
So you still have to pay. It just because the company closed down doesn't mean you stop paying because there's a liquidator who, co who collects all the debts and pay off all the creditors from that money you use. So don't think that you, you're not free of uh, your obligations. Unless, of course, uh, there is a situation where really you know there is no liquidator, the company just disappeared or collapsed, and yeah, then who do you pay? <laughs> there's nobody to pay. Thanks. Uh, Eunice, any, any thoughts on that? No, I think Dr. Toast covered that well. Okay, great. Um, another question is, you know, they've been hearing, especially for, perhaps Dr. Toast would know this answer better, but for example, spa industries or spa businesses, they've been hearing about case trust or they heard something along the lines of insurance or things like that. Um, any idea on this? Yeah, case trust is a trust mark. So as I mentioned, case is a trust mark system. Uh, trust mark system is where the the spa or the merchant uh, has agreed with case or with Commerce Net, a service provider, a trust mark service provider, that they will uh, obey, comply with certain rules, certain standards of practice. And if they don't, they will be delisted, they will be penalized, and so on and so forth. So to assure the public that they are in this case not regulated but they are self-regulated uh, please trust us because we're self-regulated and case trust or commerce trust has actually confirmed it uh, you get a little bit more confidence in, in this because when something goes wrong say a spy is case trusted you go to case and case can do certain things for you because the merchant has agreed with case on certain resolution mechanisms uh, that's the only thing, and there will be some insurance packages that, okay, you 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 get ten cents per dollar, perhaps because the company collapsed, and under this insurance scheme, you get ten cents for every dollar you pay. You don't get the full refund, but you get something back. So it depends. If you get rather than say working with a totally untrustmarked spa, you know they don't even have any trust mark at all, then your money is gone totally. Thanks, Dr. To. Um, Eunice, um, we have a further question about timelines. Uh, I suppose they're concerned about, you know, making sure they, they hit the, the timeline. Is there a, a time bar or limit to when a consumer can approach FIDREC? Um, is it at any point in time when they are in the course of maybe discussions with the bank? Or must they go to FIDREC like within one year? <laughs> Well, uh, under our terms of reference, which are the rules that govern how FIDREC works, a consumer uh, is, cannot bring a, a claim to FIDREC after it is past six months from when the financial institution issues a final reply. And this final reply is, is defined to be you know, either an email, letter, or some other written communication from the financial institution to you to tell you that this is their final response. And this final response will also tell you that you have six months to bring your claim to the Financial Institution Dispute Resolution Center if you still disagree. So there is a, a six month uh, time frame uh, from which you should come to FIDREC after you have gone to your financial institution. Thanks, Eunice. Um, a little variation on an earlier scenario. An audience member you know, noted that so far we've been talking about branded bags or particular items. But what happens if it's a service? So, for example, you buy a one-year spa package. I guess spas are you know, quite a popular item to use. Uh, so, it's a one-year spa package. Um, the spa goes out of business maybe two months into the package. I mean, in this case, you know, given that you only got two months worth of uh, spa packages, um, in that instance, is there a stronger situation that you can so-called stop installment payment since the service is no longer being rendered? I think it's the same um, situation we mentioned earlier on. Uh, I think not just spas, gyms are closing and some of them just because of the COVID, they cannot survive anymore. Restaurants too. It could be uh, uh, actually on a particular uh, food delivery plan. I mean, some restaurants do that, right? Catering, you yes. pay them every month and they send you uh, tiffin carriers every day. Uh, all these are subject to the same principles I mentioned earlier on, you've paid everything up front and uh, you don't get your services, too bad. You have lost it all. So in a situation like this, very often we 
we do take risks when we do advance payments and um, packages are always they they give you a cheaper rate because they get advance payments and even if let's say we said earlier on even if there's some packaging called an installment check that the installment is actually not you paying the bank by installments because even if the tiffin carrier is gone the gym is gone you still have to pay the bank mm. um eunice any insight into this well, I, I would agree with Dr. To because this sort of installment plan is always governed by terms and condition, right? Um, for, you know, we often just agree and, you know, we, we, we sign off on, on this package and the accompanying installment plan without really looking at the, the words. Um, but if we did, I think what Dr. To says is, is generally correct, that you would find that the arrangement is such that it is actually not a true installment plan in the sense of you paying per use, right? This is not what the installment plan is. The installment plan is someone has already paid for you upfront and you are now repaying that debt uh, in, in parts, right? And, and in that sort of situation, um, even though the service is no longer on offer, as Dr. Toast says, uh, we have taken that risk to do that advanced purchase and hence there is very little really that can be done, yeah. Well, the difference between the service situation and the good situation, the car or the bag we mentioned earlier on is you keep the car, you keep the bag, you still have to pay. But services, the service is gone, you can stop paying because there is no company for me to pay. Not only that, but they are not giving me any more services, so I'm not paying. Thank you, Dr. To. Uh, thank you, Eunice and Dr. To. Uh, we have come to the end of our webinar. Before leaving the webinar, please remember to download the materials. We will be sending you a feedback, feedback form for your completion. From all of us at Law Society for Bono Services, thank you for joining us today and have a pleasant week ahead. Thank you, Serene, for having us.